Welcome to ACL University and Seminary. The course tonight is Experience God, Knowing and Doing the Will of God. I want to make a, a few announcements before we get started. This is just an introductory to Experiencing God, a study that we'll be doing over the next 12 weeks, beginning next Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, as you may or may not know, the university, due to coronavirus, is offering free or majorly discounted life transformational studies, seminary studies, each weekend all summer through September uh, of 2020. The next upcoming thing is our Poverty, Riches, and Wealth. Study, which is next weekend, coming up. Uh, each and every Thursday evening at 7 p.m., that's incorrect. Uh, actually, all this is incorrect now. <laughs> well, we'll forget that. But either join us here at the University in Sneedville, Tennessee, or join us on our live streaming video platform. Uh, there's some, if you want to check out some of our de degree programs, come here. Okay, as we do, as we start every class here at the university, we start with praise, worship, prayer, and meditation. In response to many of us have major problems in life, because we're so concerned with what others think about us. Do you know that? All we need to concern ourselves with is with what God thinks about us. And this song is in response to that. Prayer and Meditation. Think about that, guys. I was lost, he brought me and his love for me. And his love for me. And his love says free. Oh, he's free. Thank you. 
Wherever you face persecution, you're in the same category as Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Moses, and on and on. Just like those great prophets of old, you'll one day experience an eternity with God full of unimaginable joy. The harassment, the persecution, the rejection, and the ridicule you face now for Jesus' sakes will not compare to the reward of eternity with God. So the first part of being transformed with God is to come to this realization. To put your hope in this truth. So, when has harassment, persecution, rejection, or ridicule drawn you closer to Jesus? Harassment, persecution. Pay attention to growing. To your words. When has harassment, persecution, rejection, or ridicule drawn you closer to Jesus? I don't. I haven't had any so far. Well, uh, when you're a kid, nobody ever ridiculed your friend. Oh yeah, I got ridiculed a lot. You do. Where did you turn? Turn into just your own head. Yeah. Maybe that was a mistake. Oh, well, yes. I know when we're harassed, persecuted, rejected, ridiculed, I go straight to Jesus. Well, that was before I knew Jesus. <laughs> You know, the old, I just kind of let it turn the other cheek and right. turn that in the Bible. Out. What temper, temporary troubles are you facing right now that are distracting you or could distract you from your future reward? And think of someone who has just left Hope Retreat Ranch. Right? What temporary troubles are you facing right now that are distracting you or could distract you from your future reward? <coughs> well, right now I'm kind of um, in, a, in a position, it's not, it's, it keeps coming up once in a while, but I keep turning it back over, to, keep turning it to the Lord, because I'd like to get my $20,000 paid off. Are you working towards that? Well, I'm, I'm praying about it. And okay. Pro provide, you know, I know the Lord will provide it one way or another. Or, or give me a... That could sure, certainly distract you. Well, I'm, you know, yeah, it does it distract me. Like, From your future reward. <laughs> well, I mean, it's... It comes to a point for in me where, where I... It, I, I um, Satan or myself brings it back up once in a while, right. and then I feel guilty about it because I right. feel like it's stealing. Right. And uh, knowing what you know now, the accuser is speaking to you. Right. And so saying such things as you know that's stealing, and you're going to follow Jesus and all that, and you have, you're stealing from the credit card company. Is that the kind of thought? No, it's not. It's just it's you know uh, maybe maybe, but I don't think it is. I mean, uh, I'll run by you, let you let you kind of think about it. It's sort of uh, I like to try to keep make sure everything you know I'm uh, have a good respect. Re I'm not letting the Lord down by mm -hmm. not disrespecting you know right. saying I'm a Christian and I'm following right. the Lord and. I want to, because you know, as in Paul says in Romans, it says, Oh man, oh man, man nothing but love. Right. Are you keeping your monthly payments up? I'm not making any monthly payments at all. Oh, you're not? We need to talk about that. Well, what I'm, the only monthly payments I'm taking care of is the, the lawnmower that I bought for my kids. Right. 
but everything else is pretty long. I mean, they can't, legally they can't do anything with TV. Right. So it's all in collections right now. Okay. But it's, Steve. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but it's, you know, I'm, I'm just trusting the Lord in that, saying, because he's my provider. I mean, you know, yeah. Dave. Yeah. You got anything to say about that? You even remember the question? Yeah. What do we got in our lives that might be holding us back from troubles? Me? We're talking about troubles in our life. That's what I meant. Any time troubles in our life causes to conform to the world. Well, I got all kinds of being rather than being transformed by Christ. I got all kinds of problems, but you know what? If I let the devil keep bringing it up in my head, then I'll never, I, you know. Have you learned to say, get behind me, Satan, in the name of Jesus? Yeah, but you know what? Since I came here the last time and this time, you don't realize when I first came here, I dwelled on stuff. Oh, oh God, that? yes. I dwelled on my problems. It eat me a lot, you know what I mean? But, How does keeping future rewards in mind help you deal with <laughs> why you don't want to let you answer? <laughs> now you're what, starting to ramble. What quick enough? <laughs> How does keeping future rewards in mind help you deal with difficulties in this world? Steve, you got the floor. Take as long as you like. Hey, pick a question if you want to I'm sorry. How does keeping future rewards in mind help you deal with difficulties in this world? It's sort of the same thing to me. Um, same thing. Yeah. Same thing, thing as what? what? I'm saying uh, in the future, I really do think that if I stay on a path, I might make mistakes along the way. Not Steve. But my my mind, my way of thinking now, is I don't let the past get me down like I did. I let it drag me down. Like my sister said, like that comment made today on the computer. Yeah. At the time with somebody Maxwell. Minute with Maxwell. There, there comes a time to close a chapter and write a new chapter. Yes. And believe it or not, a year ago, or right about there. It may not be the chapter that I thought it was going to be, but it's a new chapter and it's something that I can deal with. Yeah, there's not a great deal you can do about the past. Nope. Yeah, but you know me when I first came here the first time? Mm -hmm. I was consumed, I was letting things, and it wasn't... I did say that, you could talk as long as you wanted to, didn't I? You didn't say that. I'm saying... Believe it or not, this is a compliment to you all. Y'all help me change. It may, it may Christ be, is the one it may not have been. It, it may not have been in your all's time. It may not have been in my time. And I really didn't. I really, I really wondered if, if I could change because I let things get at me. Yeah. But those troubles. I'm saying I don't want to change it in the past year than I did in the past 15 years. Yeah. That's a big difference. Yeah. It's David! <laughs> it's you. you got anything to say about that? Well, I'm just uh, trying to let go of my past and, and give it to the Lord. Um, come up come up to any questions or anything like this? These studies that we've been doing, I can uh, yes, hear God's voice. Where are you at this time? Hearing God's voice and such like that. Mm -hmm. Help me out a lot. Good. Pardon me in the right direction. Do we know that before every lesson there is always a testing? Oh, yeah. Yep. To test your character, mm -hmm. honesty, loyalty. We just discussed someone recently leaving here.
which is a brother of yours. Do you think he was honest with the two of you and loyal to the two of you? <coughs> no. Should he expect blessing? Because we're, we're supposed to pray for our brothers who. Yeah. But before every blessing, there is always a testing. So God may have been ready to really bless him, but he failed the test. First Thessalonians 2 4. We speak God's message because God tested us mm -hmm. and trusted us to do so, to do it. When we speak, we are not trying to please people, but God, who tests our heart. You know the prophet Daniel, he was tested many, many times. Thus, God revealed himself much to Daniel. God tests us with stress before he trusts us with success. You know, I just think of back when I was a kid, though. My dad would trust me to do something, and it would lead to something bigger. Well, your Heavenly Father does the same thing. And that's what I was thinking. I mean, my dad let me jump in the roll back and, and drive at nine years old. I mean, that's a lot of trust in a 19 year old. Mm -hmm. The first task equals major change. Mm. There's a bunch of social pressure test too, isn't there? Yep. Plus, because of false teachers. According to Jewish law, false teachers will require people to eat certain food. Fourth, this would be a spiritual attack to change his identity in God. Remember, the Jews were God's chosen people. The four qualities God looks for in your life. Number one is integrity. I'm not going to conform to society. Doesn't right. tell what Daniel's diet was made of. Though. No, but it's on the internet. Lots of vegetables. Lots of vegetables. Nothing but vegetables, vegetables. And nuts. Yeah. And actually, after they, the chief cur servant saw how good they guys, he started feeding everybody all that stuff. Mm. Yeah. In fact, he finally went to the king. He was very respectful. He said, "The king didn't want. He wanted to produce the strongest." And Daniel kind of. Oh appeased him or approached him, which we're going to discuss in a minute, with this plan that over a period of time, if him and his three friends weren't at least <coughs> as strong as the others who were eating at the king's table, mm -hmm. then he won, and if they were just as strong, which they turned out to be stronger, right, okay. But it does tell the Bible about Daniel's diet. It doesn't mention Daniel's diet, no. <laughs> but that was Daniel's diet. I, again, it, you'll find science is always playing catch up to God, mm -hmm. regardless. Okay. Romans 12, 2. Don't conform yourself to the values of this world. Instead, let God transform you 
by a complete change of how you think. Then you will be able to know the will of God. Hmm. Can you imagine knowing the will of God, the creator of everything? Can you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, all right. Second thing we must do is personal and self-discipline. Daniel 1, 8. Daniel made up his mind not to eat the food and wine given to him by the king. That was self-discipline. You've got to understand, there were hundreds of these young men. But Daniel decided not to conform to the world, but be transformed by God. Do you not realize that he had buddies of his that probably said, Come on, Steve, everybody's doing it. Yeah, true, true. We can sit at the king's table, kick back, drink his wine, eat his food, which was the best of the best. Yeah, what's wrong with you? Yeah. Have you lost your head? Think of today's athletes. They're taken in by the NFL, brought into the king's table. They're given everything they want, and if they mess up, they're bailed out. Success with no character. That's why many of them end up on drugs and end up thrown out of the NFL. It's like really, you know, wrestling. About everybody goes into wrestling and gets on steroids yeah. so bad that they're killed herself or that that conforming to the world. I agree. The gentleman that just left that I'm a man. I'm a grown man. Yes, you're grown, but you're not mature. And you're taking on the responsibilities of a mature man. Think of the responsibilities you took on. You're grown, but were you mature? And how much heartache has that caused your life? You realize that when Daniel had decided to be transformed by God instead of conform to the world, he wasn't even a grown man, but a mature one. He was 15 years old. You know, there's a lot of guys say they're mature and stuff, but... I really don't think you start getting really mature until you're in your upper thirties or something. Well, as, as, as far as an addict goes, you're as mature as when you started using. That is scientifically proven. Problem. Number three takes courage. Willing to stand alone with only God. Exodus 23, 2. Never follow the crowd in doing wrong. And don't be swayed in your testimony by the mood of the majority. Do you know in America one of our greatest needs are men and women of courage? Yep. First <laughs> Corinthians sixteen thirteen. Stand true to what you believe. Be courageous. Be strong. <laughs> what was that chapter again, sir? That was uh First Corinthians sixteen thirteen. Thank you. Everybody 
done it. Number four is humility. Daniel came humbly before the king. He was, after all, the king. Right. And he made his request. So he done respectfully, right? Mm -hmm. When you're pressured to conform, you must be unshakable, thriving no matter what they throw at you. And then it goes on into the scripture. Then Daniel asked chief official for permission to eat other things instead. Now God had given the chief official great respect for Daniel. So Daniel had done something to gain this respect. But he said, I'm afraid of my lord the king who ordered that you eat his food and wine. And if you aren't as healthy as the others, I feel the king will have me beheaded. <laughs> That's what they did back then. Yeah. So next, Daniel talked it over. He didn't go in and demand. He talked it over with the guard, appointed to look after Daniel and his three friends. And Daniel offered a suggestion. Just test us for 10 days on the diet of vegetable and water. Then see how healthy we look compared to the young man eating the king's food. Then you can decide whether or not to let us continue eating our diet. So the attendant agreed to try Daniel's suggestion. At the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his friends looked healthier and better nourished than any of the others in the king's training program. So after that, the guard let them eat their own food. When the three-year training program was completed, all the young men were brought to king, the king's place who talked with each one individual. Now this is the catcher. The king as much as David and his three friends. So they were each promoted to position in the king's service. We might be talking right now the difference between real leaders and just the average. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So we must learn how to make a case to an authoritative figure. Because as the world gets worse and worse, and evil gets bigger and bigger. Chances are we'll all have to stand before authority figures. There's six things I might suggest, and I'm only going to give them two of them tonight. <coughs> First, develop a reputation for responsibility. Mm -hmm. That's a big thing. Did you think of that? The person who just left has a reputation for responsibility. Maybe we need a greater responsibility. No, I don't. Personally, <laughs> I think he said he was going to be back at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And if he wanted to leave, he should have said. Yeah. Something out of due respect to you and Rebecca. And to his brother. Well, I'm not sure about that. And what was resolved? Well, both of us felt like he kind of. Are we apparently or not? Yes, but he kind of hurt your feelings. Well, I told you what I would have done. Mm. 
Oh, I guess so. I mean, I would have done the same thing. It was time, I thought it was time for me to leave. He agreed with me. Well, I'm I'm shaking your hand, giving you yeah. a hug, and said, Randall, I think it's time for me to leave. Thank you very much for yeah. everything. And you're always welcome back. He's welcome back. But, I mean, just, just getting up and leaving, not making it's a It's not showing much responsibility. I told him, I'm the type of person, that if I had a motorcycle, <coughs> and I decided I was going to leave, first I said I would call him, and I said, nope, I wouldn't do that. I would actually drive the motorcycle back up here, shake your hand, thank you for what you've done for me, tell you I'm going to get my clothes in a week or ever how long it's going to be. <coughs> and ask if that's okay if I'm delayed. Yeah, I asked you if okay, but yeah, I mean, we talked about this, didn't we? Yeah. I mean, that's just me personally. If I decided, I, hey, I'm going to make a new life with somebody over here, I would have had the, the gonads to drive back up here and say, hey, I've been with you seven months. Here's my number. Here's a place where you can get in touch. If you need me, <coughs> you're around with somebody seven months. You don't just go around the place. He didn't, didn't know as he went when he would be able to manipulate her into staying. But even if that was the case, I mean, he could still grow back up here and I had enough gumption. And I mean, I know we'll probably see this, but enough gumption to say, hey, I've been around y'all seven months. You can't be around somebody seven months and not have no going at all. I, I wouldn't think, but... Anyway, uh, you know, number just, two. Can I, can, can I put in for something? Yeah. I realized I didn't give my daughter-in-law very much notice, but yeah. it was over a t period of time when I was telling her that I needed extra help here. And right. I could not, you know, and finally it just came to a point where I had to leave. Yeah, I understand. I mean, that's a little different, don't you think? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, at any rate. But I, you know, I didn't give her a two-week notice, but. You kept telling her you needed the, the, the thing is that the work program is to train you into a management position here. Don't start that <coughs> if that's not where you're going to end up. I'm investing a fortune, in my opinion, in to get you up to a management level position. Well, I'll put it like this, in my opinion. You know, whether you like working or whether you don't like working, if it's easier to say bad and it's easier to do this and do that, why snowball or put on a falsehood or act like you're something yeah. when you know you're not going to go to that position anyways? Right. If you have no intention on going there, don't work it. Don't wait. If you ain't got no money, we'll get you a job. I'm saying if you don't have no put and go through the I got him a job. Huh? I got him a job. Yeah, actually we got and him. And he has it. Number two, be humble, not defiant and belligerent. What do we say? The guy that just left is pretty defiant and belligerent. Oh, well, let me say he's humble. I'd say he's defiant. I'm not too sure. Oh. Even if God was ready to bless him, between him and God, but can't blame God, can he? Okay. We're going to join now a testimony of a fellow who went through the Experiencing God study who actually runs the uh, ministry, which is actually college credits in, in ministry, at the Angola prison. Seminary extension for New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary here. We have 16 different denominations represented and we have several Muslim students as well. And so in the, in the Isn't mix, that a, and go there is prison. 
indication of a broad spectrum of denominationalism on the farm. But you will discover if you observe this place that every single Christian is extremely, extremely in touch with the authority of the scriptures. And that whether they're Catholic or whether they're whomever, they love the Bible and they enjoy God's Word. In fact, they know more about the Bible per se than probably most people ever will because it's the one book that they have that they can give themselves to and they can pray over and they can ruminate and enjoy God's presence. And it gives them the individual freedom of saying to themselves and between themselves and God, what are you saying in this? And then they can apply whatever scriptural principles they gain from it. And that becomes the heart of their life and their message. Their message is magnificent because it's the simple karugama, the core, Jesus Christ is Lord, and then all of the events that come forth in the Gospels concerning his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, coronation, and then the giving of the Holy Spirit. And so there is so much for them. And when they study in our school, and this is all put together for them, then they're in, enabled so much better and are worthy of their role as an inmate minister. But the curriculum at the school is straight out of the catalog with just a few tweaks for this particular setting. And so it's a 126 hour curriculum credited by SACS, Southern Association of Colleges and Schools. And of course, it has the same joyful accreditation that the campus schools enjoy and then as well the state universities. So it's fun to be in a school that keeps its standard very high. All the professors have to have 18 graduate hours in each of the subjects that they teach. We were investigated by Sachs last spring, had absolutely no recommendations. They were so very proud of what we're doing here. And uh, the seminary is very happy with our work and position here and of course they contribute so much to the professorial uh, opportunities they bring so many from on campus here as well as those in the neighborhood who are qualified to teach come from baton rouge and elsewhere so it's a fun thing for most everyone who comes here because it's such an eye-opener but it's fun because the church here is so alive and we're so grateful to be touched by the New Testament church. And that's something that we believe is happening in Angola. One of our great Baptist leaders said upon observing this place that perhaps in America revival will begin behind bars <laughs> and will spill over into the oh, populace. Yeah. That would be a wonderful thing because it's no doubt that God is at work here. Well, in short, Angola was the bloodiest place in America that was considered to be a prison. The farm itself was a plantation, and in the process of being dedicated as a prison, it was worked like almost slave labor. Conditions were, I understand, horrendous. And all the stories of how bad it would be in a prison in the South for truth. And of course, uh, I've had the students tell me that it wasn't too many years back to where you saw blood on the walk almost every single day. And um, my first clerks said, you can't even see a good fight here anymore <laughs> because of what Christ is doing at Angola. But this prison was so harsh and so structured away from any form of rehabilitation. It was so punitive. Now there's still a punitive element, but 
when God comes inside of a person's heart and begins to change him from the inside out through the Holy Spirit, then when that Word of God is hidden in one's heart, he begins to change and be transformed in the wonderful way that we have promised to us. That We're so thankful to see these changes. They're normal now here. And we have the contrast of knowing what this person has come from out of his crime and out of the debilitating circumstances of his broken life. And then we see the reconciliation of God in him and then the reconciliation through God to man that we begin to see more than moral rehabilitation we see what the new creatureliness in Christ brings. And of course, the world will always say that moral rehabilitation occurs from the outside in, that a man resolves to be better. But the Bible teaches us that that's not so, that only through the Bible's Word being made alive in us through the new birth and sanctification and what he does through discipleship and setting us apart and the Lordship of Christ being applied to our lives and coming under his full authority and sovereign rulership, then we know that that's how our minds are transformed from our new heart. And we begin to know the perfect will of the Father. And that's what these men know. And that's who they know. And that to be a very important part of the discipling of prisons throughout the state of Louisiana. But I predict that state lines and legislatures are going to tear down the barriers and that some of our men will go farther than the borders of Louisiana because God has broken down barriers bigger than state lines. And I believe with all my heart. But this is what he's about. I think that's valid and I think you can say it with a sense of reliability and confidence that uh, you've seen Macedonia. And it's not because of what we've done. It's because of what he's allowed us to do. Somewhere, the men who took experience in God felt called to preach. There was probably 30 of them. The Baptist men of Baton Rouge were faithful and came up. And somewhere in the mix of of that, they really solidified their call to the gospel ministry. And they said to Warden Cain, and they had his ear, we want more. More. And I could name who they are, but it wouldn't mean anything to you. Four or five of them are dead now. And he heard them. And he called on George Roundtree, who was an LSU professor, who had been a consult here, was a Baptist deacon. <clears throat> and George said, well, you ought to get a college here, and uh, that would help. And T.W. Terrell, the Association Director of Missions for Judson, which is Baton Rouge Baptist Association, was his pastor at one time. And so he called on T.W. And Warden Kane and he met through Dr. Roundtree. And then he presented the need. And at the very same time, T.W. was fulfilling a five-year plan that we had done in Judson about Christian education in our area and had just talked to Dr. Level at the school at New Orleans and had convinced the school to open an extension center in Baton Rouge. 
And when Warden Kane told him the need and said, can you do this, then T.W. had the confidence that he could because he'd just done it in Baton Rouge. So he calls Dr. Lavell and then Dr. Dukes comes up here, Jimmy Dukes, and they meet and everybody's nodding their head yes. Nobody's nodding their head no. And what a vision and what a dream. And then the seminary commits to it, the trustees commit to it. And before we know it, God's driving this train down the track and all of us are finding a box car to get in. And if we can, we shut the door and don't tell anybody we're here and let him keep on driving it. And that's been going on 10 or 12 years. We have over 200 as a result of May 22nd who will have received BAs and associates. So that's about 400 degrees. And these are all in Christian ministries. And uh, these guys will walk up to one of our people that come from graduation, like the president or someone who has contact with the other side of the administrative task of this, and they'll say, you know, I never finished anything in my life till I did this. Hmm. And that's big. That is big. That Let me tell big. you, the inmate ministers keep records, and for over now seven or eight years, they have been averaging between 22 and 25,000 contacts per month. Is that phenomenal? That's a lot of ministry. Katrina invited a response here at Angola as a result of several thousand prisoners being evacuated out of the New Orleans area to Angola. In fact, if you recall the imagery of the prisoners on the interstate bridge, all of those were sent here. And it was a very difficult time for our officials here and administrative uh, tasks were almost impossible. And in the process of this, there was a great deal of tension in the air. And they were bringing these guys in and these guys didn't know who they were in the setting they were in, and there was a lot of fear that there was going to be disciplinary problems. And so somebody thought of their of our inmate ministers, and they said, send in the Marines. And that's exactly what they did. They sent our inmate ministers in, hook, line, and sinker. Our guys moved in those 2,000 went to work on them one-on-one -on -one. before one full night. They worked around the clock. I don't know how many nights, but before the first 12 hours, they had settled down that bunch. Now, at that point, the men in blue, the security, were no longer frightened of what was going to happen. They were all under control. They were beginning to minister to people. As a result of that time, over 200 of those outside inmates were baptized by our inmate ministers. Wow. And they constantly were ministering to their needs. They, they raised among the inmates of Angola love offerings of toilet items like uh, deodorant, toothpaste, you know, any, they just left, you know, they didn't have anything. And so our guys started sharing out of their own stashes what they had. And they gave away thousands of items of toiletries that would make their, their lifestyle better. Gave them clothes. And they didn't have anything when they came. I mean, and these people just did a wonderful job, and the administration did a wonderful job, and it was a good time in the Lord. There were times when 30 men would be saved in a Bible study. Wow. Just point blank. Profess Christ for the first time. <coughs> it was really beautiful. 
and the women that came as well. There was a large number of women. Over 50 women were saved and baptized. They had them out of Camp Elf. They totally evacuated Camp Elf and made it a women's prison. Fortunately, our chaplain's department was able to be there and be with them and coordinate that, and it was very carefully done. But the inmate minister still had a good good hand in it. And of course, it was, you know, native to native at that point. And so consequently, their influence was far-reaching. We had a Bible study over there for over probably 10 months before they all left. You sure? My good? Yeah, let's see. Sit, sit, relax for a second. Yeah. Stay. 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 Hey, baby girl. Okay, I don't know how many of these sessions you've done, Steve. Do you remember where you started? It was a session six, I believe, when you started. Yeah. Well, in, in the study, how to experience God, we turn into the inside back of her. We don't have our book. So that's all right. Sorry, I didn't know. From memory, could someone tell us <laughs> the seven principles to experience God? Well, God, is always, God is always working on you. Yep. God pursue your love. I, <laughs> Number two, she'd already given it away. God pursues a continuing love relationship with you that is real and personal. Number three, I think that has to do with uh, crisis. No. God invites you to become involved with Him in His work. Number four, you're right. Number five is what you said. No. Oh, it's not? Number four is God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church. The church is the body of Christ. If you've had a bad experience with the church, don't feel pregnant. Many people have. We're talking about the body of true followers of Christ. To reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. Number five. God invites to join him in his work. that leads you to crisis, crisis. crisis of belief that requires faith and action. Right? Number six. You must make major, major adjustments. adjustments. In your life to join God in what He is doing. In number seven, you obey and you will have experienced God. Now, in that context, talking about the Angola prison. Someone went through the experiencing God study and saw that God was working in a horrible, horrible pit from hell prison. Yeah. Now, during the study, God did what? So that was God's work, right? So God pursues a continuing love relationship with you that is real and personal. So he accomplished that step. And then God invites you to become what? 
partners involved, involved with him and his work. We had the gentleman we were talking about who just left here. Does anyone here know what his calling was? Yeah, we apprentice and ministers. We work in the apprentice and ministers. A call from God. Now do I say, what is your call from life? And it's this. I tell you, you tell me what. You'll find it's something to do with what you're passionate about and what you're gifted in. Well, Michael spent 20 some odd years in prison. I would imagine he's pretty passionate about it. God called him to that ministry. Was he responsible to his call? Or did he let them down to it? He, might, he let them down to it. By being conformed to the world instead of being transformed by God. Yep. We don't know we know that was God's purpose for creating him. Right? Right. I wonder how many people that affects. And if he doesn't fulfill his purpose, who will? Do you suppose he's even thought about that? Not even caring about the dog he left behind. <clears throat> I would say probably not. No. Then God speaks. That's where I came in. But then it's God's invitation for you to work with Him always leads you to a crisis of relief. And what you do then reveals what you believe about God. Does it not? Yes. Because you would have to make major adjustments in your life to join God in what He is doing. But He decided to go back to His own way of living. Thus, He never experienced God. Because He didn't obey, thus allowing Him to experience. The guy from uh, the prison mentioned most of these guys <clears throat> have never finished anything in their life. The only thing Michael has ever finished in his life is a mandated, made to finish prison term. No relationship has he ever finished. Nothing else has he ever finished. Do you realize how close he was to finishing something? About a month. Is that where Satan came in and said, <laughs> You're a loser, man. You can't finish this. I don't know what happened. But you see, you can feel what I'm saying. And for our viewing audience, through experiencing God, this is happening in prison. Think what He can do for your life. I've seen this study taught just as a Sunday school class. I've seen it taught as a series.
for the whole church. This is put out by the Southern Baptist Convention. And then I've seen it taught and led by anointed teachers that lives were transformed. Miracles happen. The Angola prison stories is one of numerous Well, let's take a look at uh, the authors of this study, uh, Henry Blackby and Claude King, and now, this has been around so long now, uh, Claude is no longer on board, but now Henry's son has joined him, Richard Blackby. And this is just an interview with the two of them. Um, <coughs> about how the whole experience has been over the years. Cut. Then we're just going to watch a little bit of this. We're going to do it on video. Huh? Video. What? Video. Yes, I like qualitatively different relationship with God. Mm -hmm. uh, all through this conversation, you've given God the glory. Right there. 